In this episode of Marie TV, we do have some adult language. So if you have little ones around, grab your headphones now. Hey, it's Marie Forleo, and you are watching Marie TV, the place to be to create a business and life you love. Now, if you've ever wondered what it's like to navigate topics like race and identity and activism online, my guest today has some valuable lessons to share. Francesca Ramsey is a social justice advocate, comedian, actress, writer, video blogger, and sought-after speaker with over 38 million views on YouTube and over a half million followers across social media. Her work has been featured on MTV, The New York Times, and the BBC. A former writer and correspondent for The Nightly Show with Larry Wilmore, Francesca is the host of the award-winning MTV web series Decoded and co-host of the podcast Last Name Basis. Her docuseries Francesca recently premiered at Sundance and her first book, well, that escalated quickly, Memoirs and Mistakes of an Accidental Activist, is available now. Francesca! Thank you so much for coming back. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Okay, people, this, I don't know if you can check this out. I'm going to try and hold it up so you can see all of these <laughs> cute little tabs. And this is only like a tiny fraction of what I've underlined or marked. And this is the galley copy. Now we have the real copy. Francesca's book. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I know. I texted you and I was like, girl, Ugh. it's so good. I was reading it on the plane. I was laughing out loud. The guy sitting next to me was like, what's happening? Because it was <laughs> it was like bursts of out loud laughter. That makes me so happy because when you're working on a book, as you know, you get into this, you're so close to the work yes. where you start wondering, does this make sense? Is this funny? I don't even know. And then by the end, you're like, I hate this. Yes. <laughs> But I want to tell it's it's so real and it's so raw and it's so hilarious and honest and it's so like you Thank and you. it's just it's brilliant and I hope everyone gets not only one copy but multiple copies for their friends for many many reasons which we're going to talk about starting right now. So I want to start off with a line that I highlighted and tabbed one of many you wrote as the conversation about social justice broadens. I wish we could be more understanding of those coming to it later than others. It can be really scary to admit that there are a lot of things you don't know. We live in a world where people are quick to pounce on you if you express confusion or ask a question. This, my friend, is why I love you and I love your work because I feel like you have this incredible gift to open up conversations and to do so in the context of humor and pop culture and we can laugh and it helps people drop their fear and their defensiveness and really be open to learn. So tell me about why this book and why now. I mean, for me, I feel so very fortunate that I've been able to build this awesome career talking about important issues, using all of my talents, but oftentimes I feel a little embarrassed or self-conscious when people measure themselves to me. And they say, wow, you're so smart. I wish I knew all the things that you know. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, they have no clue that I'm still going through this journey and that there are things that I didn't know and mistakes that I have made. And I found that when people have been honest with their growth and their journey with me, it's really inspired me. So I just wanted to do the same, especially because unfortunately, lots of people don't do that work. It it feels so rare for people to say, you know what, I used this language at one time and I'm ashamed of it, but I don't use it anymore. And this is how we can move forward. So I wanted to just try and lead by example. I also loved because you wrote you wanted to pay it forward too and to show how inevitable mistakes are for all of us. Oh, absolutely. I mean, reading this book, and we'll, we'll go through some of it later, but I was just like, oh, like I was feeling hit in the gut by how many things I've said, how many things I've done. We even talked uh, when we were talking on the phone, like remembering pop culture things from when we were kids. Are you kidding and me? And songs that- I don't, there's some shows that, you know, you see them as uh, as reruns. Yeah. Um, and I think, oh my gosh, I remember like uh, watching Martin and I love Martin, but the Shanene character, when you see it back, I'm thinking, this is so misogynist. This is so like- homophobic and there's just so many themes in there that I remember as a kid loving and enjoying and as an adult 
I'm looking at them with completely different eyes. Yes. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that's something that we all have to be willing to do. But again, I think because so often people are not transparent about the fact that they have done that work and they have changed and grown, people feel really attacked, which is a word I don't necessarily love, but I can understand that when someone says, this thing that you love is problematic, this word that you said hurt my feelings, people melt down. And I think more people would be open to to changing and learning if more people said, hey, this is a mistake that I've made as well. So it's really the crux of this book. Yeah. And it's brilliant. So when we had our first interview, which was amazing, we talked about your viral video, Shit White Girls Say. Mm -hmm. But we didn't really get into what happened after you appeared on Anderson Cooper and right. things blew up in every sense of that word for you. Yes. <laughs> um, you wrote, I was being ripped to shreds because I didn't know how to respond to being ripped to shreds, meaning the avalanche of hate that was coming at you from almost every direction. Tell us about what happened in that experience. You know, I went on Anderson and in retrospect, I don't think I did a bad job in the show. I had no agent. I had no manager, no publicist. I mean, I really went in there completely without any help, with no safety net, you know? Yeah. And so I think we did a pre-interview and, and I felt com confident in my answers. But when the interview came out, there were lots of people that really felt that I did not talk about white privilege. I did not actually explain, you know, systemic oppression and, and discrimination in ways that they felt really did the conversation justice. Yeah. But I genuinely didn't know how to do that. You know, I made this video about my experience coming from South Florida and, and being in spaces where I was often the only black person at school and at work. And so it felt very authentic to me. And I, I don't discount the, the realness of that video or how it touched people, but I didn't have the language or the knowledge to talk about what I'd actually captured. So there were a lot of black people that were like, oh, she got it wrong and her boyfriend is white and she said this wrong. And I was just sitting at my computer having a meltdown because on the other side, I had people saying like, oh, you're a racist for making this video. And I didn't know how to talk to them or to talk to this audience that I had cultivated with this video who now felt disappointed because they felt as if it was a sham, like a, a freak accident that I had made this, this viral video. And I feel very uh, fortunate that there were people that reached out to me and they were like, hey girl, you need to actually understand why people are upset. And you need to also understand that getting defensive with people who care about you and they feel like this work really spoke to them and now they're disappointed that you don't know certain things, getting defensive or being sarcastic or talking down to them is not helping. And for me, that's my humor has always been my coping mechanism. Yeah. So when people would call me out, I was just like, oh, sorry that you don't have a viral video. <laughs> like, that's not really a way <laughs> to respond to criticism, but that's what I would do, yeah. you know? And, um, and so I felt... I, I was just thankful that someone said, like, the way that you're going about this is just not the right way to do it. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why I was so open to saying, okay, all right, sure, I'm, I'm going to do this. Um, a woman reached out to me and she wrote me this long email and she gave me like a reading list and she was like, read these books. And something she said that really stuck out to me is she said, you have a talent for this and a lot of people are going to listen to you. And so you need to get this right. Mm. And I was just like, oh, okay. All right. I want to do this. <laughs> um, and so I, I found out that that was my talent was taking these important conversations and finding ways to talk about them in digestible, funny ways. But in order to do that, I had to piss some people off first and yeah. realize that I wasn't doing it in a thoughtful way and I didn't really have all the information. One thing I want to highlight just how incredible your book is, is the fact that you don't just talk about this experience. Like I was reading, you actually have the text oh. and I don't, like of what <laughs> folks said to you. Yeah. And again, I'm one they of those- They were ripping me. <laughs> I mean, it was almost, I, I almost got sick to my stomach for you. I'm a very empathetic, so I feel all the things the and I was way. reading and I, and I just felt my, and I was like, oh my gosh. So it's it's just so instructive, and I feel like you've done this throughout the entire book. And I know, and you know this, we have so many folks in our audience who are creatives, aspiring creatives, established creatives, who are feeling more and more fearful 
about doing something wrong, or even if it's not in the area of race or identity, even just putting out their creations and right. having folks not like it. Um, one of the things I think is so brilliant is you're like, nope, here's what somebody said to me. Here's exactly how they tore me to shreds. I just want to make sure that people <laughs> know that I'm not speaking from this place of, of inexperience. Yes. And that, I mean, don't Google me, but if you really want to, go for it, because I have been called everything except the child of God on the internet. Like. <laughs> And, and then there are days where it would really hit me, right? And I think oftentimes when it really hurts is when you realize there's a grain of truth in there. Yeah. And you say, oh, wait a second, I didn't think about that thing or I, or I didn't understand that thing that I talked about or that thing that I created. And so for me, I try to encourage people to say, remember that it, sometimes it is going to sting and it's not always going to be in the package that we would most appreciate, yep. but sometimes there's something in there that's truthful and it's okay to take a step back and and reframe and, and say like, okay, why is this making me so uncomfortable? Is there something in here that is telling me like you need to, similarly to that video that you made about jealousy, like when you feel that twinge, Maybe there's something in there that's telling you, okay, you need to change directions. You need to look at this from a different perspective, or this is something you need to dive into. I feel very similarly similarly about when you get called out. Um, and so for me, I, I did need that experience. Let's talk about when you went to the other side. You, as the hater, uh, quote unquote, mm -hmm. you wrote, if you participate in the shit slinging contest, competing to come up with the most creative insult, you end up covered in shit. Mm -hmm. So tell us about, do you feel like you kind of going after people for lack of a better word is like part of your humor? If we want to talk about the Lena Dunham ex I think, example. So I think for me, I, like most people, I had my own insecurities growing up. Yeah. But through those insecurities, I found out that the way that I was able to mask them was with my humor. Mm. And so I would make jokes, unfortunately not about me, about other people. And that was how I made friends. That's how I was able to disarm people that felt uncomfortable around me. But unfortunately, oftentimes those insecurities took the forefront. And so I was just like a bitch. Like I was just, I sometimes I, I, I've, been able to make relationships with people that I went to high school with that I maybe didn't know very well. And I feel like there comes a point where someone says like, I really hated you in high school. And I'm like, I know, I'm so sorry. I was a terrible, insecure person and I'm not that person anymore, but thank goodness. Um, and so when I decided that I wanted to go into entertainment, I feel like I had gotten better, but the internet kind of like brought that dark side out. And I think it's because, especially with social media, you can see what everybody else is doing. Right. And that can feel so overwhelming if you're not happy with where you're at. And I would just go into like a K-hole and I'd be like, what are they doing? Oh, look at her. She booked this job. And then they're hanging out. Of course they're hanging out. Like just like <laughs> going around and like making myself feel like crap. And realizing that it just wasn't productive and it, it, I was at a party and I ran into this girl that I had had a lot of negative feelings about and she was so nice when I met her in person and she just gave me this really great advice about creating a contract with yourself for your work and not measuring yourself against anyone else. And that really like reframed how I felt about my work and then later on, you know, I found that even when I was rightfully critiquing someone and saying you said or did this problematic thing, that sometimes that jealousy would seep in and, mm -hmm. and there would be things that had nothing to do with it. And and I, I talk about Lena Dunham in the book as someone who rightfully gets called out all of the time. Like, do not get me wrong. She, she screws up a lot. But oftentimes, and I was guilty of it, the criticisms turned into like, and she dresses bad, and her body is a mess, and like, who would who would even hook up with someone that looks like that? Like, none of those things are relevant. And we see that happen all the time, whether people criticize Donald Trump and they say, oh, he has a small dick. Like, who cares? Like, our world could potentially end. I don't give a F about his date. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> But, but it inevitably seeps in. Yes. And unfortunately, what happens is the person that's on the receiving end of that message, even though there's a lot of great stuff in there, the nasty stuff 
ruins it. I, I liken it to making a cake. You make this great cake and then you're like, I'm just gonna throw some vinegar in there. You just ruined the whole cake. All the good ingredients are there, but all I'm gonna taste is that vinegar when I take a bite of that cake. So I had to acknowledge that I was going about things in, an, in a way that was not productive. Yeah. And I hope that when people read this, they can say, oh crap, I have so done that too. Absolutely. And that's why I felt like even with the Lena Dunham story where, um, just to summarize, you were making some videos about the show Girls and then unbeknownst to you, you wound up I at ended dinner, up at dinner with her. Sitting next to Lena, <laughs> but yeah. then also letting her know. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's another thing I think where I know that people say things online that they would never say in person. Yeah. And here I was, I had an opportunity where I said, well, I have a chance to say some of the things I've said online about you in person, but I also have to acknowledge that I've said some stuff about you online that I don't really feel very good about. And unfortunately, not everybody has the opportunity to sit face to face with somebody that they have trashed or said nasty things about. But I think we have to try and put ourselves in that person's shoes and say, that does not excuse the ignorant or hurtful things that you've said or done, but we should not lower our own moral standards in order to call someone out. And I think uh, if you think about it in, in the context of not just that person, but who else is listening, yeah. right? If I'm, if I'm saying nasty things about your appearance, who else in, in our circle is hearing those things and maybe feeling self-conscious about their own appearance, right? Yes. And they didn't do anything wrong, but we don't live in a vacuum. So when I say these things, you are not the only person that is being affected by them. And our words have a lot of power. And I think I oftentimes forget that. And especially when you're on social media, it's like you have this giant megaphone and everybody is piling on this one person and they don't realize how many other people are hearing that conversation and saying, oh, well, I'm never going to talk about that <laughs> ever <laughs> because everyone's going to call me ugly or they're going to say my husband looks like this or... I shouldn't wear these kinds of clothes or I don't have this kind of job or whatever it is. And none of those things, in my experience, have anything to do with, you know, someone's moral fiber or their character. That's all extraneous stuff that oftentimes we don't actually have control over. And so why beat someone up for those things? Let's talk about call-outs versus call-ins, mm -hmm. which I know is becoming quickly some folks' favorite chapter. <laughs> um, I thought it was such a genius distinction, and it's fascinating. Can you share with us what both of those terms mean? I think a lot of people, if they have not actually heard the term call-out, they've just seen it happen. Yeah. Where a celebrity says something awful, you know, whether intentionally or unintentionally, racist or sexist or homophobic online or in an interview or, you know, in a movie, for example, and they are rightfully criticized for it. And so we see think pieces, we see long Twitter threads, which I am so guilty. I love a Twitter thread, <laughs> um, where people are saying like, you did this thing. This is terrible. We all need to talk about why this is bad. Um, but it happens in a public way. So it is a conversation that lots of people are participating in. And again, oftentimes that is necessary, right? Like I don't have a personal relationship with a Kanye West, for example, right? So the criticisms that are happening around the things that he is saying are happening in a public forum. Um, I mean, John Legend texted him and then it became like a big thing where Kanye was tweeting out the text, right? So when you need to actually call someone in is when you have a personal relationship with them. So you might text them or you might take them out to coffee or pick up the phone. Uh, or even if it happens on a, a social platform, but in a private place, like a Facebook message or a DM, in my experience, it doesn't always work, but I find that it makes the conversation a little bit easier if everybody isn't watching, if, mm -hmm. if everybody is not participating in it, right? And I've had times where I've had family members put their foot in their mouth on, their, on my Facebook page, and then suddenly somebody I went to college with is like, oh, I'm, I have time today. And I'm like, my <laughs> dad doesn't know who you are. And now they're like in my Facebook comments arguing with my family member, and then somebody else jumps in and suddenly just – I liken it to like a WWE match. Like, I don't even watch WWE, but like it's a performance, right? Like yeah. everybody's like, blah, <laughs> like jumping in. 
And they're like, oh God, tag me in. And then they're like jumping and someone's in feathers. Like it's just like a whole thing. And the person who might have really screwed up yes. is just confused. And they don't know who all of these people are. And so if you take them aside and you say, look, here's why what you said was really not okay. Let's talk about this. Um, again, I have found, because people did that for me, yeah, right? When right. I was being descended on because I screwed up on Anderson Cooper, I was lucky that somebody pulled me aside. A few people messaged me and they were like, read this article, like read this book. Um, and so there's something really um, enriching about being able to be that for somebody else. Yes. Because the call outs can be very positive in the sense that, again, the message can reach lots of people. It can start a global conversation. But oftentimes the person at the, the very center of it, they just tune it out, especially when all that other nasty stuff starts coming in. You have some um, great questions, and I will share them if that's okay. Sure. The six call-out rules. Number one, what's the issue? Number two, what's at stake? Three, I love this one, do I have all the details? That's a big one because on the internet, you know, you can't unring a bell. And I have seen and I have been on in the, the wrong on this one where something happens and, uh, you know, a, a great example or a terrible example was after the Boston bombing. Mm -hmm. There were people on Reddit who were trying to figure out who it was and they were going through all the photos and they found a photo of some guy and they decided that he was the guy and they got his Facebook and they put his name all over the internet and he was not the guy, but you couldn't unring the bell. Wow. And now suddenly he had to close all the social media. He was getting death threats. I mean, the police said he had nothing to do with it. But again, you didn't have all the facts. And then people felt like they were trying to do the right thing by sharing it. Right. They were posting it and they were like, if you know this guy, do something. So their hearts were in the right place, sure. But they didn't have all the information. They yeah. were sharing something that was going viral at the time, and and it can be very easy to get swept up in that. Um, and again, I, I say that as someone that has made that mistake. The next question is also a really important one. Why am I doing this? Right. Why am I doing this? And then I'll, I'll share the last two and we can discuss what are the best and worst case scenarios that could follow this call out? And would it be better to call in instead? And I think that last one speaks to something that all of us need to practice more is that pause, that moment of introspection before we're about to pound away. Like I've made a rule for myself. I can't go on social media after I've had even like a sip of wine. Oh. Like it just – My Instagram stories wrong. are Liddy McLitterson because sometimes I'm in Glisten. I've had one glass of rosé yeah. and yes. I'm about to tell it to you all. <laughs> So that's a really good rule. Yeah, no, it's a I, and I discovered it back. I think it was like all the way back, which feels like eons ago in an internet age, in like 2010 or 2011, when I came home from something, some kind of industry event, and had like two glasses of wine. Which for me now is like that's Same. like I'm done. Same. I'm ready for bed. I'm ready for some water. But someone said something, and I was just like, Oh, Jersey! Oh, I call yeah. her Jersey Marie. <laughs> Jersey Marie's coming out, and. She, that bitch is not kind, and she, she's sharp, and mm -hmm. she's going to say all kinds of things. And you can't take it back. Cannot take it back. <laughs> that in the morning, I, I remember looking. I was like, that's not me. Like that – so that's my new rule. But just getting back to this, would it be better to call in instead? And this idea of like taking a moment and having a breath. Anything And you that want? doesn't – I think that's so important because that's not our inclination online. Everything moves so fast. And something's going viral and everyone's like, I got to say something about this right now. And then you realize everybody's saying the same thing or things that just are not contributing in any way. They're just speaking to speak. Yeah. And oftentimes when like this massive call out is happening, everybody's like, let's make jokes, let's make memes. And sometimes they're super funny. I enjoy a lot of them. But sometimes I think, Gosh, it's going to really suck if we all descended on this person and they actually didn't do anything wrong or we got the we got the wrong person or we don't have all the facts. Um and also I think thinking about why are we doing this is really important because I have found personally that I would make a call out and I would be sitting there thinking, "Wow, look at how many retweets this got." <laughs> Instead of like, well then that that's what I did this for was for retweets. 
I'm not even thinking about what the real issue is here. And I see that happening all of the time, where you see that people are chasing likes and retweets, and they're going on and on and on about this issue that happened. And you realize, well, you don't actually care about the consequences of this person's actions or or their words. What you care about is making a joke that's going to raise your profile and getting really great engagement on your Twitter. Um, and I just that really breaks my heart often because I don't think you know, a a popular Twitter profile or, you know, a pop in Instagram is not changing the world. Like it's not making the world a better place. It's gratifying you in that moment. But in the long run, I don't necessarily know that it's worth it to slander someone or, or just completely embarrass someone for the purpose of making you more popular, making you feel good. Which brings me to another highlighted section of the feels like thousands in this book. (laughs) You said, I wonder, I sometimes wonder how much further along in my career I'd be if I hadn't dedicated so much time and energy to these people. Now, just talking about kind of getting into the muck. You shared, this is also why I've pulled back from social media lately. Not only has it made a huge difference for your productivity, but also allowed you to reframe your goals and priorities. So tell me how... Things are different for you these days in terms of dealing with folks who you either consider haters or trolls or just, you know, navigating. Because obviously in this moment is about it's book. It's book It's promo. book. Yes. Book town. <laughs> you are the mayor right now. And we are helping because everybody does need to read this. But generally speaking. I mean, I think you really have to think about social media in terms of what your goals are. Yep. And everybody's are different. You know, some people are on social media purely to connect with their friends and family. Some people are there to promote their business. Some people are, you know, want to be writers or you're a chef or you're a fitness guru or or whatever it is, right? And so that should, I believe, shape how you engage and use social media. And I found that my goals as being a writer, being an actress, being a performer, I was not staying true to that because when I went on my Twitter, I was just arguing with people all day. Yeah. <laughs> or I was going off about some issue and I just, even though I might have thought that I was rightfully upset or or passionate about that thing, I didn't necessarily like the way that I was presenting myself. And so I had to step back and say, well, what is it that I want to accomplish? I was in the process of working on the book um, and and my pilot, and I realized this is zapping me of my creative energy and my time. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uplift the voices of other people that I feel need to be uplifted. I'm going to share content that I think is important to me, but I'm not always going to center my voice. Um, I'm going to try and be more positive online. So if a song really spoke to me, I might share that. I might talk about a television show that I enjoyed. I, I talk about my own work. I talk about someone else's work that I enjoyed. Um, and so I still use social media. I'm just not using it as a crutch yeah. to get my frustrations out about the things that are going on in the world that, again, um, I have every right to have those feelings about, but I don't necessarily know that it's productive for me to spend three and four hours on Twitter yelling about something yes. when instead I could put that time into creating content that might help inform people about that issue. Yes. I love what you wrote here. And I think this is so instructive for everyone, again, because we have so many creatives in our audience. And one of the questions I get the most from people like, oh, I can't balance everything. Like, how do I know where I should be putting my attention and energy? And does it all need to be on, um, you know, on Instagram or on whatever social platform? And I love that you wrote, maintaining a productive, rewarding relationship with fans doesn't require a social media addiction. It means doing good work that people respond to. And I was like, yes, Francesca, <laughs> yes. It was a little um, also for for me, it felt affirmative because I am not hyperactive on social mm-hmm. and I absolutely have had the guilt fest about it. Like, oh, I'm terrible. I should be doing more. And then I kind of slap myself in the face and go, oh, girl, like you're creating the work. And, yeah. Everybody's, you know. everybody's relationship with social is going to be different. And I feel like that's with all platforms, with all different types of people – you have to do what works for you. You know, yeah. what works with for your relationship doesn't necessarily work for my relationship. The way that you um, spend your Friday night is going to be very different from the way that I spend my Friday night. And I th- feel the same way about social media. And I th- I'm very much of the mind of quality versus quantity. Yes. And 
you know, I follow some people or I have followed people in the past that are just creating, 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 creating. And I have found that it becomes harder for them to maintain a level of quality in their work because they are just stressed out all the time. They are chasing those likes. They're chasing those views rather than stepping back and really focusing on making something the best that it can be. Yes. And I try to think, well, what's the worst What's the worst thing that could happen? I'm not going to post on Instagram today. Like nothing <laughs> is going to happen if I don't capture this moment for the internet and make sure that it's perfectly lit and gorgeous for social media, yes. right? And so I like thinking about like just the other day I actually looked up. I was like, when did the iPhone come out? I'm like, oh, I think it was 2007. I like pretending my world is 2006. Oh, leaving that damn thing wherever <sighs> it needs to be. And I'm like, oh, I have always, I have always been addicted to my phone. Yeah. I, I'm just, I've always been a techie. Um, I remember pre iPhone, I went on eBay and I bought a phone from China that you could record your own uh, ringtone yes. because this was a big deal. <laughs> you couldn't do that at the time. And I remember like waiting for weeks for it to come and and like making – anytime my phone would ring, the silencer wouldn't be on and everyone would be like, what's that? And I'm like, oh, my cell phone. Like, <laughs> So I can't really go back to the time <laughs> before. But I do think – Thinking about the fact that we weren't trying to capture everything for yes. everyone yep. is is very important to yeah. try and get back to that. And living in the moment is was one of my New Year's resolutions. Yes. Uh, instead of trying to capture the moment for everybody else. Yeah. Anytime I go to a concert right now, I'm telling you, I have to keep – so I have an internal toggle. It's called slap a bitch mode. It's basically <laughs> like – that's like if if I toggle over there, Jersey Marie is around and it's not pretty. And um, whenever I go to concerts now, um, I it, it takes Everybody. all the restraint. I'm like, put your damn phones down. And when I went to I went to see Dave Chappelle, and um, he he took everybody's yes, phones. I wanted to do cartwheels. I was like, this is the best thing ever. We ta I talked to people. No one was holding their phone up, and we actually got to experience not only the magic of his genius mm -hmm. and uh, the other performers, but actually the audience and like say hi to people around. I don't know. It was I, awesome. I agree. And again, I can see both sides of it yeah. in the sense that the internet has connected so many of us. Of course. Us. us. Yes. Absolutely. But I do think it has taken us out of so many moments. And yeah. There's nothing worse than when you're out with friends and you look around and everybody's on the phone <laughs> or everybody's taking pictures of what you're eating instead of enjoying what you're eating. So I'm trying to do less of that for sure. Awesome. Let's talk about self-care. And I love that there's a chapter about self-care is not selling out unless it is. You shared, it's always strange to me when people start dictating what you must or must not do to be a good black person, a good feminist, or a good advocate. Do I have to keep tally of all my activist points to prove I've earned a moment of rest? And then I got chills with this Audre Lorde quote. She wrote, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. It's so funny because... I feel like we are in a culture, not just as activists, where we prioritize working all the time. And I feel like that is a, a very American way of thinking, yes. right? Like you go to other countries and they're like, sorry, it's four o'clock. I'm done. Sorry, we're on holiday this it's month. It's August. <laughs> Our entire, the whole neighborhood is closed up because yes. it's holiday and we're not here. Whereas here... It's just like work, 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 work all of the time, you know, like I work 80 hours a week. And and when I hear people brag about those things, I think that sounds like you don't get to t enjoy yourself or take time for yourself. And especially as people who are trying to live socially conscious lives, who are doing work that often deals with life, life and death, who are having difficult conversations with the people that we love, yep. um, the people that we work with just moving through the world as a marginalized person, we need time off, yeah. right? And so that time off is going to be different for everyone. For me, it's getting my nails done. It's going – Which look gorgeous, by the way. <laughs> this is a lifestyle. Um, you know, this is something that for someone else, they might think, gosh, that it seems like a lot, right? But for me, I'm on Pinterest coming up with colors and ideas and designs. And I'm I'm really excited to plan this thing and then sit there and not do anything. Yeah. You know, and just relax and just enjoy 
one, not being on my phone because I can't be, um, talking to, you know, my nail technician and, and, and joking around with her and finding out what's going on in her life. Um, just taking time for myself, whether it's hanging out with my husband and our dogs or uh, going and get a foot go, going and getting a foot rub or journaling. Another thing I've been trying to do more of is just say no sometimes. Yeah. you know, get you on the no train. You can't say yes to everything. And we talked about this having a day where you say, this is the time that I don't work. I'm done working at this time. Yep. I'm spending my weekend not working. Yep. I'm not on my phone in the evening. I'm just watching a movie and hanging out with my husband. Um, I have found that, unfortunately, there are people that are co-opting the idea of self-care right now because it, it is profitable. So you have people saying, self-care is this candle. Buy this candle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it doesn't have to be something that you spend money on. It yes. can be just taking five minutes in the morning and taking deep breaths before you go out into the world. Um so it is something that has really helped me, but I think it's also something that we have to prioritize in good times so that when things do get challenging, um, it's easier to go back to that self-care practice because we've made it a habit. Absolutely. I think it's a conversation we need to have more of because there is like with the, you know, hashtag hustling all day. And again, I'm a very hard worker. I know you are as well. As creatives, we do a lot, but it's also really important to model. That's why we closed down our company for two weeks in the summer, two weeks uh, over the holidays. And we try and we create bumpers in our lives mm -hmm. so that we do take that downtime. And it's like whenever anyone on the team is going on vacation, we actually have a policy. No one else can can email them. Oh, I so love they that. come home and they don't have a gajillion emails. They can actually return and re-enter work mm -hmm. from that place of feeling rejuvenated. Um, let's move on to uh, some of the more tactical things. We're getting toward the end of the book, which again, fucking love it. You wrote, sometimes it feels like no matter how hard I try, I can't say anything without offending someone. And since I'm a person who loves to run her mouth, hi, that can be pretty difficult. So I love the sections in the book. You have Activist Lent. Mm -hmm. You also have Francesca's simple explanations of not so simple concepts. So you said one of the keys, if we are to step in it, which we all will. Absolutely. And put our foot in our mouth. We will do this multiple times over our lives and careers. You shared to avoid being defensive, to listen to what people are telling you, and work to do better. That feels like kind of the basic recipe. And that's, of course, easier said than, than done. done. For sure. <laughs> you know, it is everybody's natural inclination to get defensive when somebody says that, you know, that you've hurt them. Um, one of the things that was really eye-opening for me was understanding this difference between intent and your impact. And I think most of us don't intend to say or do something that is harmful, yes. but that doesn't change the outcome of the words or the actions that we participated in. Yes. And so I use the analogy of if I step on your toe and I break your toe, I didn't mean to break your toe, but your toe is still broken. So if I focus on, well, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, you're like, take me to the hospital, help me. And I'm like, <laughs> I didn't mean to do this though. Like, how am I actually working to fix the problem that I created regardless of if I meant to or not? And I think we often have to step back and say, let me let my ego out of the way and actually listen to the person on the other end so I could understand um, the consequences of my behavior rather than trying to convince them that I did not mean to do the thing that I inevitably did. Yes. Okay. We have some cringeworthy comments that we need to say goodbye to that you share in chapter 12. Let them 12. go. Okay. So these are some things that... Um, and I haven't, honestly, this is this is the honest truth. There's been conversations online, I'd say over the past like five years or so, where um, I've said something about what was happening in our world, mm -hmm. our culture, and I've seen these come up and I wanted to put my head into my computer and I'm like, <laughs> and I, but I couldn't go there because like you said in the beginning, I, did, I was like, I don't have the language. I don't understand this. You're like, I'm not, I know this makes me feel uncomfortable. Yes. But what do I do? But I had no – and it's just – and I feel like in the past year or two years, my eyes have been so open. And I'm just on the little tip of the iceberg of mm -hmm. my learning journey as it comes to a lot of these topics. But when um, – when someone is describing their experience as a person of color and someone else says, well, I don't see color, can you share a bit about why this comment must be laid to rest? <laughs> um, this is one of those things that people say with the best of intentions. Yes. Um, I think in their minds, it makes them feel as if, well, I am 
an elevated person that does not prescribe to the, the system of racism and, and race. And I think that that's what they're, they're trying to say. Like, I am not a racist because I see you as not black or I see you as not, uh, you know, East Asian or, or, or whatever background you are. Um, and essentially what that is saying is I don't see or understand the experiences that you have as a person of color because I am black. You know, my, my comeback is even in black and white, I'm still black, right? Like this is still who I am. I liken it to if, if you wore glasses, I wouldn't say, well, I don't see you with glasses. You're like, girl, I wear glasses and I need them to see. Like this is, it doesn't, it doesn't make me who I am, but it's part of my experience. It's part of how I move through the world. You have glasses. I am a black person. It does not define me, but it shapes how I move through the world. And I think it's really important when somebody is talking about their experiences, whether it's as a person of color or as an LGBTQ person or as a person with disabilities, to not invalidate their experiences by saying, well, I don't see you that way. You're just like me. Like, no, I'm not just like you. We are different. And that is totally okay. It's okay to see me as different. The problem is to treat me differently because of those differences. So I think that's a distinction that a lot of people don't understand yes. because it feels it's been made to be taboo to talk about our differences, especially when it comes to the differences of race and, and the experiences as a result. Thank you for that. And uh, I need to go here because, again, another one. Whenever Black Lives Matter comes up and the response, well, all lives matter. And I need to say this because this just speaks to your genius and your level of humor. Your comeback that you wrote in the book had me in tears and I do need to read it. It's okay for a movement to be focused on a specific group or cause. Save the rainforest doesn't mean fuck all the other trees. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's it's funny because, again, when we talk about race, this is one of those taboo topics that make a lot of people uncomfortable. Yes. But they are able to understand the difference when we have a walk for breast cancer, right? No one would think it would be appropriate to come up and say, well, colon cancer is also a thing. It's like, yeah, I know, but this is an event for breast cancer. And it's okay for us to talk about breast cancer now. And it doesn't mean that colon cancer is not a big deal or that we shouldn't think or think about or address that problem. Uh, Black Lives Matter is the same. It is a movement that was created to address systemic inequalities in our justice system and, and police violence that impacts Black people. Yes. It is not saying that police violence is not a problem for any other community. You know, police officers unfortunately kill more disabled people than any group, right? So that is an issue that also needs to be addressed, but this organization is focused on this specific issue and as it relates to Black people. Yes, all lives should matter. Unfortunately, they do not. And that is why, or they are not treated as if they all matter. And yes. that is why this organization was established. And that is why it is doing work and, and calling uh, attention to the inequalities that already exist. And the one that I took note of when you said, although you've used it yourself, this particular phrase now makes you cringe when you hear someone say, check your privilege, excuse me, check your privilege. Tell me about that. I think the only reason that it makes me cringe is because so many people just don't understand what it means. And so I found that it like ends a lot of a lot of conversations instead of furthering the conversation. I do think often we do need to check our privilege. Um, as a straight woman, for example, there are so many experiences that I don't have, whether it be holding hands with my husband walking down the street and not feeling like my life is in danger, um, knowing that if I disclose that I'm in a, mar in a relationship with a man, it's not going to close any doors when it comes to looking for housing or a job. Um, those things are not my fault. I did not create those problems, but I need to understand my privilege in order to understand those problems. But when the phrase, check your privilege, comes around, the word itself carries so much weight that people automatically think that that means they've never had any problems, they've had everything handed to them, or they're wealthy. And so it feels like a demand rather than a suggestion. You know, uh, I use the analogy of when you check your coat, 
You know, they say, would you like to check your coat? No one's like, check your coat. And you're like, well, I'm going to keep my coat because you just told me I needed to give it to you. You know, when in reality, like checking your coat is a, is a convenience that ends up helping you. Yeah. Um, and I think of understanding our privilege is in the same way, that it helps other people. It helps us better understand the world. Um, and it's something that we should all be open to doing. But I think we have to encourage people to do it rather than... Uh, like shouting at them to do it, especially if they don't actually know what we're asking them to do in the first place. <laughs> that That's where it becomes problematic. And I've seen that happen so much online where someone just, uh, the person who's being told that. Oh my goodness. They're, they're like in headlights and then there's a, a whole language that folks start using and talking to them about and they're just scrambling because they're just confused. The minute yeah. you tell someone to check their privilege, in my experience, they're like, one time I broke my leg when I was in third grade and I couldn't <laughs> swim all summer and it was so terrible. And you're like, ah, okay, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. <laughs> they give you a list of like every single time like a black person was mean to them or, you know, they got a splinter or, you know, their parents got a divorce or all of these things that are valid experiences, but yep. don't actually have anything to do with privilege. Yes. Um, and that's why I try to talk about my own privilege first. So again, as a straight person, as an able-bodied person, I found that that helps a lot of people understand. It's not just you have privilege. We all have privilege. You also said, I can't know it all. My voice can't always be the loudest. Let's talk about how you've continued and continue to be a student and educate yourself while listening as well as you talk. I mean, I try to use this awesome platform that I've, I've been so fortunate to have. And you've built. Yes. Yes. yes I, I, I've, I've built this platform, but I've also been very fortunate that people have believed in me and given yes. me opportunities to be here. And so I want to do the same for other people when I can, whether that is getting, you know, people writing jobs on Decoded or, or working on my pilot or, or on-camera opportunities. There have been times where we've done topics about uh, being a, a Latinx person or being a Muslim or a non-binary person. And I say, well, I actually can't speak to this experience. So why don't we find a great writer, comic performer, a journalist to consult on this episode or to come be a, a co-host on the episode? And it's great because it just gives them an opportunity to reach a larger audience. It enriches the content. And I've found that oftentimes people have, again, great intentions. They want to diversify, but they don't realize that diversity is not just on the paper. It's who's behind the camera. It's who's, you know, at the, at the board, in the boardroom, you know, who's on the board of directors, who's doing the marketing, right? So if you want to reach audiences that don't just look like you, you have to include their voices in, in the conversation um, and in the creation of the content. And so I, again, try to lead by example and I'm so fortunate that I've been able to build this awesome community of, of people that are different from me that, that want to work together and make great stuff. I love it. So let's end with um, something I feel like is really tactical. It might be a little bit of a uh, reminder because we, we talked about this before, but I don't think we can ever hear this enough. At least I can't. Let's talk about how important it is to own our mistakes and the two parts of a simple apology. So again, I think that if more of us were – transparent about the mistakes that we've made, that other people would be willing to own up to theirs as well. And unfortunately, so many people uh, fail when it comes to actually giving a successful apology. And the first thing that you have to do is take responsibility for your actions and then commit to change. So uh, when you apologize for something, you want to say up front, like, you know, I understand that I used language that made you uncomfortable, and I'm really going to work to make sure that I don't use that language anymore. And the thing I actually like to throw in there is a thank you, because it is really difficult to call someone out or yes. call them in. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of emotional labor, especially if someone takes the extra time to share some resources with you. Um, just saying, you know, thank you, one, for believing that I can be better. You know, and I think that we have to remember that when people do call us out or when they call us in, it's because they believe we have the capacity to be a good person and, and do this work. Yes. And so you want to say thank you for believing in me because I want to I want to be better. And so for me, you know, that 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 combination is one that we we see so rarely that in my experience people are are really 
open to seeing that change and, and believing in you as a result. I adore you. I love you, which you know. <laughs> Thank you so much for being you. Thank you for this incredible body of work. And I feel like it is, I mean, you have such a, a beautiful body of work already, but my heart tells me like this is the beginning of just Oh my goodness, oh, so many you. more great things we get to hear and see from you. So. Thank you so, so much. It's just like such a dream talking to you. The first time that we talked about the book, it was just this huge weight off of my shoulders. Yeah. And, you know, I think the thing that I love about you is you are really about helping creatives fulfill their dreams. And, and we all have that moment of, okay, I'm going to put myself out there. I've made this thing. This is my baby. I love it. I'm going to release it into the world. And so it's just so affirming to hear all these positive things about it. So thank you so much. And thank you for giving me a place to, to share my work with your audience. Always. Now, Francesca and I would love to hear from you. So we talked about so many things today. I'm curious, what's the biggest insight that you're taking away? And how can you put that insight into action starting right now? Now, as always, the best conversations happen over at the magical land of marieforleo.com. So head on over there and leave a comment now. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to our email list and become an MF Insider. You'll get instant access to an audio I created called How to Get Anything You Want. Plus, you'll get some exclusive content, special giveaways, and personal updates from me that I just don't share anywhere else. Stay on your game and keep going for your dreams because the world needs that very special gift that only you have. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll catch you next time on Marie TV. Ready to find your voice and sell with heart? We'll show you how. Get started now with our free writing class at thecopycure.com. Side effects include enlarged profits. Your comeback that you wrote in the book had me in tears and I do need to read it. It's okay for a movement to be focused on a specific group or cause. Save the rainforest doesn't mean fuck all the other trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>